Hi everyone, welcome to another final exam Viva session. And today I've got Sarah. Hey Sarah, how you doing? Good. How are you? Not too bad. Hey, are you where are you based? And um, you've already done a few Vivas so far. Uh, where are you based? What are you up to? What kind of feedback and what things do you want to work on? Um, so I'm at John Hunter in Newcastle. Um, and AT2 just started AT2. Mm-hmm. Um, feedback probably just to stay high and don't dive too deep into details too quickly and sort of let the examiner take you where they want to go. Yeah. Um, That's good. And just to, yeah, to say what you would actually do when you're in the situation. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Let's try to focus on those things. So uh, we'll make this like a real real exam as much as we can. Two minutes reading. At the end of the two minutes, I might actually ask you what you've done for your, in that two minutes, and then we'll yep. just launch into it. Um, so this is what the stem looks like. And just for the podcast, I'll um, read it out as well. So it's a you review a 67-year-old man in the pre-admission clinic for a left hemihepatectomy by a rooftop incision for metastatic colon cancer. Uh, he underwent a right hemicolectomy four months ago for primary cancer resection. The procedure was complicated by an extended stay in hospital due to suboptimal pain management. Um, past medical history, hypertension, low limb peripheral neuropathy, secondary to chemotherapy, and also an ex-smoker with 30-pack year history. Medications and allergies, and no allergies, but perindopril and amitriptyline are the meds. Observations in pre-admission clinic, blood pressure 160 on 85, heart rate 75, uh, SATs are 98% on room air, weight is 65 kilos, height is 180 centimeters, BMI is 20, uh, and then a few liver function tests. So the bilirubin 50, AST 40, ALT 38, ALP 560, GGT 110, Albumin 35, INR 1.1, all the other blood results are normal. And the question is, outline your concerns regarding the patient's fitness for surgery. Um, so I might, I might give you 90 seconds, just to make it real. And uh, let's start the timer now. Hey, Sarah, so that's about time. Um, before you get started, uh, what did you write in that two minutes? Um, so I wrote down up the top of my page how old he was, um, where I was seeing him, so pre-admission clinic, mm-hmm. and that is um, the issue that he's coming for, so a left hemi hepatectomy. Mm-hmm. Then I've just listed down his comorbidities on the left side. Um, then I've written some notes just to answer sort of the question. So what mm-hmm. are my concerns um, regarding the patient fitness for surgery? I've mm-hmm. um, just written down a couple of headings there. Um and then I've written a sort of, if I was then to talk about um, anesthetic-wise, what are my my issues for this patient having a surgery? Great. So you got a, quite a few things down, which is which is fantastic. So let, let's let's crack on and start. Um, candidate one zero three. Do you understand the question? Yep. Fantastic. Please outline your concerns regarding the patient's fitness for surgery. Okay. So this is a seventy, a sixty-seven year old gentleman having a high risk surgery um, with a known cancer. Um, in terms of assessing him for fitness for surgery in addition to my usual anesthetic assessment I would be particularly interested in um, his cancer and how it affects him including his what metastasis has so it's apparent that he's got what looks like a liver metastasis also if there's any other metabolic effects um, mass effects and any other medication side effects apart from his peripheral neuropathy which he already has Um, so I'd like to know what um, regimen he's on with the chemotherapy and whether um, he's had any assessment of his cardiac status in particular. Um, I'd also like to know a bit more about these liver mets. So I can see he's got some deranged LFTs with um, the bilirubin being raised as well as the ALP and GGT. So I'd like to know um, if there's any signs of liver failure. So whether he's got any physical examination signs of liver failure um, and other biochemistry. We've got a normal INR there, um, but I'd also like to see the platelets and urea. Um, Then I'd like to know a bit about his functional capacity and how well he's recovered from his previous surgery. I note he had issues with suboptimal pain management, um, and he's only on amitriptyline, so I'd like to do a DASI and an NS clip on him um, to try and assess his um, sort of his functional status currently, and then I'd arrange further investigations from there if I was concerned. Good. Any other concerns about his fitness for surgery? 
Um, so his sats on room era 98. Oh, no. No, sats are all right on room air. They're not terrible. So just make sure that they're um, stable and has got a good exercise tolerance. Um, in terms of other fitness for surgery, for cancer patients, they're often, often malnourished. So I'd like to make sure that his um, nutrition is optimised preoperatively as well as he'll be having a large surgery and likely an extended hospital stay. Yeah. And can you comment on that at this point right now? His, his, no. his albumin is 35, which is often um, a bit lower if they're um, – you know, nutritionally deficient. So he seems okay from an albumin perspective here, at yep. least. But he's um only he's only his BMI is only twenty, so he's likely cachectic and has lost weight from his cancer and therapy. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on from that. So let, let's say uh, you do a bit of an assessment. Is there anything from his past history you want to assess further? I can see he's been a smoker in the past. Um, so I'd like to know when he stopped. Um, and if there's any um, downstream effects, so he's at increased risk of COPD, ischemic heart disease, and strokes in particular. Wait, he's uh, mentioned that he might have heard the diagnosis COPD, but he's not so sure. What would you want to ask him? So I'd ask him a little bit further. Um, has he ever needed to use any puffers? Has he ever had to be admitted to hospital with a chest infection? And has he ne- ever needed to go to ICU or be on a ventilator? Okay. Um, then I'd ask about does he each day does he ever get symptoms of a cough or dyspnea? What activities can he do um, before he gets short of breath? Which might be multifactorial in this setting, but I yeah use that as a baseline. Yeah, great. So let's say uh, he's got mild COPD, good lung function showing mild obstructive pattern. Um, he's also had a loss of weight of about twenty kilos, so pretty substantial. And just from his previous experience with pain, he's very concerned about pain. Uh, so specifically about that, what do you advise him about pain management because of his concerns? Yeah, so I'd ask a bit about um, which parts in particular were painful for him. So was it immediately postoperatively or was it once he was outside of, um, let's say, ICU, if he went to ICU post his hemicolectomy, um, and what type of pain? So try and ascertain whether it's a somatic, visceral, or neuropathic type pain um, and what it was in particular that bothered him. And then I'd talk to him about the possi- the options that we have. So I would go through um, from basic simple analgesia to a PCA and then to regional catheters and also I'd discuss your axial techniques with him. Okay, let's say his pain seemed to be everything was worse really. What, what seemed like visceral pain, somatic pain, the incision, it all was heightened and it went for longer and his existing peripheral neuropathy flared up as well. So everything was pretty severe for him in terms of pain management. Um, okay. How do you want to, you mentioned a lot of things there uh, for pain management. And what, what, would you say, what would you say just your provisional pain plan overall for this, for this gentleman? I would plan to do a spinal with a higher dose of morphine of 300 micrograms intrathecally. And I'd plan to send him to ICU postoperatively as well. And then intraoperatively, I would also run a ketamine infusion um, and I would add a lignocaine infusion too. Um, but I'd probably just run slightly lower doses because he's got a mild amount of um, liver, hepatic impairment. Okay. This patient is, uh, uh, I think we said 60 kilos. Yeah. 65 kilos. Uh, yeah. What do you, how do you run? What would you run the ketamine and what would you run the lignocaine at? The ketamine, I'd give a 30 milligram per kilo um, bolus dose at the start. Say that again. How many per kilo? uh, 0.5 mg per kilo, so 30 milligrams him. Yep. Um, And then I'd run it at, I'd start it at 10 milligrams per hour and Mm -hmm. titrate up or down as required. Mm -hmm. Um, For the lignocaine, I will give him one milligram per kilogram loading and then run it at one milligram per kilogram per hour Mm -hmm. and i turn that off an hour prior to cessation so that i can perform um, some subcostal taps as well um, and lateral taps depending how large the incision is Um, and then the neuraxial i just put in one milligram of um, intrathecal bupivacaine um, sorry one mil of 0.5 just to basically carry the um, intrathecal morphine yep so five milligrams of uh, that okay so uh, what do you do for your tap blocks, your catheter techniques? What are you doing there? So um, th- since this is quite a high um, incision, I do a subcostal subcostal taps as well as lateral taps so that it'll be quite large. So he'll have um, one on both sides. Great. So let's say you've um, got all your monitoring set up and everything. Uh, literally, what do you do? What do you give? Okay. Um, so you said I've done my monitoring, IV access, everything like that. So yeah, it's end, end of the operation, yeah. Yeah, I'd put 20 mils of 0.2 in each side. 
Okay. And so 20 mils point, is there anything else you're doing post-op? Um, yes, I'd also have a PCR running and I would have, sorry, I failed to mention that I'd used um, IV fentanyl as well intraoperatively. Yeah. Good, good. Uh, now, what do you do in terms of dosing? You've given lignocaine IV at decent doses. Do you Are you running then the same thing straight away for ropivacaine? Like, you, are you doing maximum? So I'd, I'd turn the lignocaine off an hour beforehand, <laughs> an hour before the end, mm -hmm. um, and then I, and then I'm happy to give normal doses because you should have metabolized it. Okay, what's the, what's the half life of lignocaine? Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I guess in the I think it's around an hour, maybe. <laughs> I feel like it's longer, but that's all right. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, let's say that's the... Is, is there anything else, broadly speaking, about your pain plan? Um, I'd have a regular pain team follow-up for him as well. Um, and that's probably all. I think I mentioned paracetamol earlier, so I'd give paracetamol. Um, yeah, but these hemihepatectomies, what, what kind of paracetamol dosing are you giving? I'd give one gram TDS. What's that? He's on uh, what's, what's he on for a neuropathic pain at the moment? Just amitriptyline. Right. Would you, would you do anything else with that postoperatively? I'd initially see how, so I'd continue his amitriptyline and I'd see how he goes um, postoperatively, but I could consider adding in pregabalin um, if he's struggling further with neuropathic pain. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't add it in straight away just because there'll be a number of agents um, that'll make him quite sedated um, yeah, yeah. already postoperatively. How, how do you start pregabalin? Let's say he's day two post-op and still got worsening neuropathic pain. How would you go yeah. pre pregabalin? So assuming he's got normal renal function, um, yes. I often, in a healthy person, would start at 75. But because he's a bit older, a bit frailer, has had a big surgery, I'd just start at 25 milligrams um, and then assess him the next day and increase that um, to 50 or 75, depending on the kind of sedative effect for him. Yeah, sounds good. Now, let's say you've done all your pain plan, the operation goes six. Oh, sorry. And this is preoperatively now. So you're just about to see him. Uh, you've already reviewed it in pre commission clinic. He's come to you, optimized and everything, and he's in the anesthetic bay with a blood pressure of 210 on 100. What do you do? This is a pretty high blood pressure. Um, I would aim to recheck it to confirm the reading oh. and to try and do it also in a room that wasn't the anesthetic bay, so an environment that's more settled and more calm. Right. Because you, do, you, do, you do all those things, you check it, blah, 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 and it just comes back at anywhere from 200 to 210. Okay. So this is still quite high. Um, I would arrange, I'll do an AD assessment on him, um, make sure he's got no symptoms from that, do an ECG as well. Um, and then I have normal. to start with Okay, I'd have a discussion with the surgeons. Um, I guess this is cancer surgery, so I'd, it's not an ideal blood pressure to start with. Um, I'd also just call his GP and check what his control has been like in the community or ask the patient if he does it at home to know what it's been like. Uh, minimum, like There's very little information on this. You can't see any records. Okay, um, so I'd ask as well whether he's taken his um, regular antihypertensive. Yep, he has. He has, okay. And is he feeling anxious? Yes, he is. Okay, so it may be anxiety related. Um, so I'd screen for any sort of end organ effects, and yep. assuming there was none of that, I'd just flag it with the surgeons, and I'd discuss with the, another colleague to see whether it's reasonable to proceed. Right. I and guess I'd have. It's, it's, it's just, oh, sorry, you keep going. Have a pretty high threshold to um, defer because it's a cancer surgery. Yeah, um, good. High you, you wouldn't defer lightly. Like you err on the side of going ahead. Yeah. The, the surgeons obviously want to go ahead because they won't care that the blood pressure is that high. Uh, yeah. So your, your call is to go ahead? Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, you mentioned int introp plan, general anesthetic. Well, uh, we, we didn't go through a lot of the introp plan. So tell me, what is besides the pain stuff, uh, what is your setup for this case? Okay, so I would plan to do a general anesthetic with an endotrich endotracheal tube um, in terms of IV access I'd have two at least 18 bore cannulas ideally one 16 gauge and I'd have an art line and a CVC which I'd be I'd place the CVC post induction and the art line pre-induction particularly since it's hypertensive um, other monitoring that I'd have um, would be a biz probe um, or an entropy um, neuromuscular monitor temperature probe IDC Great. Um, That's all good. So let's say you crack on with your chosen anesthetic technique um, and everything's going pretty well. Let's say 30 minutes into dis dissection, the surgeons are complaining about a bit of blood loss. What do you do? 
So I would initially scan the field and check the patient's monitors. Um, it could be blood pressure related in him and also filling status. So I'd see sort of where the blood's coming from, if it's generalized ooze, and then I'd check um, his heart rate and blood pressure and aim to deepen the anesthetic initially um, whilst I assess other things I can do to assist with the blood loss. So I, I would be running, in this case, propofol and a, and a low-dose remifentanil infusion and I'd increase both of those. Right. Let's say the blood pressure is actually about 110, 120. It's come down very obviously with the anesthetic. Uh, what are all, so what are you going to think about with this surgeon saying blood loss? It looks like there's just lots more ooze around the region. Yeah. Okay. So it could be related to having a high CVP. Mm -hmm. So it makes sure that I hadn't overfilled him. I could also change the positioning of the bed and have the patient a little bit more head up and I'd reduce my PEEP and reduce my um, positive pressure ventilation. Right. Uh, let's say, um, yeah, this, the, let's say the CVP do, is, is high and you do those maneuvers. Is there anything else you do to uh, help with that? Um, I could lower the blood pressure a bit more. Yep. Um, oh, sorry, well, my, actually, my question was, how much fluid do you expect to have given by this stage? I shouldn't give much pre-resection. How much? Less than 500 mils. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so any, let's say in spite of all these maneuvers and your minimum volume that you've given, the CVP is still pretty high and it's you know, at the right level and everything, so it's still about five and the surgeons aren't happy with that. What do you what do? You do? Um, I'm not sure what else I could do. I've changed positioning. I'm think, trying to think of other things I can optimize to minimize the um. I, 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 mean, I may have missed something. You said you you minimize fluid. Uh, yeah. Alter the position. Uh, yeah. Maybe lower the blood pressure. You, I think yeah. you run some more Remy or run run some more profile yeah. or fentanyl, whatever it is. You've done all I of this. Turn off my I turn off my peep. Yeah, you turn off your peep. Is there anything else that you typically do to have a low CVP in this case? Um, I'm sorry, what, what do you run GTN? Really make sure that it is parallel. Pardon? What do you run GTN at normally? Um, I haven't actually done one of these large resection cases. Um, okay. So the only times I've used GTN is um, in incremental okay. volumes of like 50 mics per mil. Right. Uh, let's say it, it, the surgeons are, they see that number and they're like, oh, actually, look, my, my other anesthetist always runs GTN. How would you run it? Okay, so I would put 15 milligrams in 50 mils and then I would start it at five mils an hour. And how many mics per minute is that? Oh, I think it's like 300 mics per mil. Um, so that That's right. We won't do maths here. It's fine. <laughs> the, the blood pressure suddenly drops to 60. What do you do? Okay, so this is a rapid drop so i would call for help mm -hmm. um scan the surgical um field see if the surgeons are pressing down on the ivc and ask them to stop if they are mm -hmm. um and i would temporize with vasopressors initially still keeping in mind that i want to avoid fluid at this stage in the surgery um but and so you scan the field and the surgeons do have a bit of bleeding um and it, you know it looks like a decent volume that's collecting there yeah what do you how do you deal with this Okay, so he probably does need a little bit of fluid replacement, so I'd initially give 250 mils crystalloid whilst giving a 0.5 milligram um, bolus of metaraminol and assessing for response um, whilst I look further to see if there's other, any other contributors. I'd um, turn down my remifentanil and propofol infusions um, and then I'd assess the patient and see if there's any obvious signs of uh, arrhythmias, um, and Could you do all those things? Like, patients safe enough? Blood pressure is hovering at seventy. Uh, the surgeon said, "Look, we we nicked one of the uh, a, a small vessel, and we're trying to fix it. Um, but yeah, he, he's lost probably. There's probably a liter in the sucker, and maybe two fifty, three hundred of that is uh, other fluid." Um, okay. So it's quite a lot of blood loss. I would. Um, I've called for help, so hopefully I've got a second anaesthetist ready to give me a hand. So I'd send off a blood gas, and I'd call. Um, I'd organise for two units of blood, which I would have pre-cross match prior. So I'd have two units of blood brought round to um, give them. Mm -hmm. And then I'd, if this if the bleeding's ongoing, the surgeons aren't able to gain rapid surgical control, I'd call for an MTP as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'd make my aims with the MTP would be to avoid a dilutional coagulopathy, um, to maintain high to avoid hypothermia and acidosis. So I'd be monitoring those things as well as calcium. Okay. Anything else? Um, I could also give some TXA. Mm -hmm. 
to assist with stabilization of clot. Good. It seems like the surgeons are, are really struggling uh, with the bleeding. The blood pressure is now 50. Keep going. This is very bad. So I would, um, this patient may need CPR imminently. Um, so I would assess for a pulse in the patient. And if yep, that was pulse, abnormal, pulse is there. Um, just the blood pulse pressure is low. Sinus, sinus tachy at 140. Uh, all the other parameters are normal. End title C2 is around 30. It's around 28. Yeah. Okay. The surgeons basically get, need to gain control while we continue with our NTP resuscitation. Um, so I'd arrange for Belmont to be brought in so we can <coughs> give large volume blood that's warmed to our patient as well. Yeah, good. Hey, we're going to stop there. <laughs> well done. <laughs> How do you feel, Sarah? Uh, all right. <laughs> I, I think you did great. Um, so uh, let's go Let's go from the start. Like, but First of all, like you've got a really good technique. So first of all, you're speaking really well. You, the speed, the pace of your speech is fantastic. I wouldn't change any of that. Um, or all, all of the kind of the non-technical, like non-knowledge stuff, it just seems really spot on. So I think you're doing really great with that. Um, in terms of so kind of from the top down, in terms of concerns for fit, patients' fitness for surgery, you really went through everything. So, you know, the, the STEM everything there is there for a reason. And I like that you kind of just stepped through it. You said this is a hemiheft, it's a high risk surgery, um, or a cancer, then you started going through the five M's, meds, metastases, met metabolic medications, but, you know, you're just ticking off these things as you're going. Um, you mentioned the readings, so, you know, lots of people might look at those readings and not actually mention them. So great that you, you mentioned them. Um, and then I think you mentioned the observations. The, the one thing I do with the observations is to maybe make a comment like a BMI 20, that's pretty low in an elderly person. Or, you know, just go straight for it and mention that. Um, and I and I would have then because it he, he doesn't have too much in the past medical history, but but in terms of concern for surgery, you definitely said exercise tolerance, and I think you even may have mentioned a risk scoring system or functional capacity or something. But to then say ex smoker, how bad is it? COPD, and then yeah. peripheral neuropathy. I'm really worried about pain because that might be included in fitness for surgery. Yeah. Um, and then it looks like the hypertension isn't necessarily well controlled because the blood pressure is 160 on 85, according to that. So I would have just gone a little bit extra in terms of commenting with the observations and the past medical history. So that was great that you were going through these things really effectively. <clears throat> and um, yes, yeah, so concerns, you got went through those things. Oh, yeah, and you mentioned the, yeah, you, sorry, you mentioned the values in the ALT and the ASTs and stuff, which is good. Um, so I, I gave you the information of mild COPD, loss of weight, 20 kilos, and very concerned about pain. And yeah, so the one thing I would, I think your pain plan was fantastic. You know, it, 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 it sounded like you've been doing anesthesia for a long time because you just kind of were hitting things very easily in terms of, you know, intrathecal morphine and spinal and the dose of it. And then, um, you know, ketamine intraoperative and post you were very fluid with that and it didn't have to draw out anything. I would have just started with the whole look at the pain optimization specialist management because often in especially in private maybe even in public uh, you you get this whole pain plan before you even start and i feel like that's just the one extra thing to add contextually um i've also just mentioned here set expectations because every time i get one of these patients now because i know that i just can't always win and i i really try to just set that as an expectation that's probably more practical in real life um you gave me so doses for each of them lignocaine dosing um, <laughs> I always find it funny because I, yeah, definitely lig lignocaine. A lot of people I work with absolutely give a full dose, twenty mils of 0.75 straight after they've stopped the lignocaine. Um, yeah. I think it's just very forgiving to have lignocaine or pivocaine, but you know, the, it's one of those things. I, and, I, and I wonder what you would say because would you yeah. go? You, I mean, you gave me a 0.2 percent pivocaine, which is a pretty small dose. Yeah, um, and I know in reality people just put 0.75. So I, I feel like you were yeah. safe in saying cease it at one hour. It's a low dose to start off with for a pivocaine and I'll start an infusion. So I, th I think you can get out of that trap of realism versus, is that really kosher? Is that really right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, your answer for the anti-neuropathics was absolutely spot on um, and re really realistic. Like, I like that you're, you're talking out of re realism. Like you're saying, oh, yeah, you know, I'll think about pregabalin and stuff, but I wouldn't start it now. The mainstay of my allergies is this and maybe later. And so I think that was a really good answer. <laughs> you cracked on with the blood pressure. This is cancer surgery, but you did the collaborative discussions because, you know, who, who's ever, who's really going to stop, unless you get symptoms, which is what you said, who's going to delay this case for cancer surgery? It's just not a thing that I would imagine happening. So that was good. 
Um, and again, you came to the decision quickly. So I feel like a lot of people in this exam will get to the decision very slowly. And that's a, that's a big deal if there's too much coercion to get to a decision. So that's good. Interop plan, exactly what I do. And so maybe I would mention when I'm saying my interop plan, and maybe I interrupted you a bit early, you told me the, the, the high points, you know, art line, CVC, and, um, uh, you know, general aesthetic with intrathecal morphine and bupivacaine. Fantastic. Those are the high points. I don't really care about anything else, but maybe I would mention, I realized that this is a blood loss case and I need to keep my CVP low because that's a specific aim and I'd be prepared for the Pringle maneuver if that was required. So maybe that's an extra couple of things I'd mention. Blood loss. Yeah. I think you managed this really, really well. You know, you're kind of liaising with the surgeons, figuring out what's going on there and, and, you know, managing uh, the thing. And, and it's just a difficult, I wasn't sure where to go with that, with my questioning actually. So, but you know, you, you answered it absolutely appropriately that this is really, they need to fix it and I need to keep the patient stable. So I'm just going to, again, you list off a whole bunch of things that you do. And I thought that was completely appropriate. Um, yeah, GTN. Um, so you said 15 milligrams in 50, in 50 mils. Most people, okay. Most most people run 30, 30 milligrams. It's a, five, it's a 50 milligram vial. 30 milligrams yep. is six mils. Chuck it into the 50 mils range. Uh, mil per hour is 10 mics per minute. Kind of oh, yeah, okay. three, yeah, three milligrams of adrenaline in 50 mils. Three mils now is three mics per minute. So, uh, And that's absolutely something I'd run um, yep. all of these. And I'd started at the start of the case because then you just had to turn it up a little bit. And you're right about the fluid. I'd, I'd definitely not let 500 mils go in. It'd always be less than that. So that, that was good um, that you had insight into that. Um, so you, with the GTN, do you run that for these hepatectomy cases from the start? I do, yeah. And I've in every hospital is very hospital specific, but it just helps because yep. I'm, I'm running like one mil an hour, which is nothing. Yeah. But then yeah. the GTN's at the end of the thing. Like, like those cases where you're, you know you're going to be running it at some stage, you just yep. run it at a low dose and then you can start Put, turning it up yeah. um and often i mean cvp is just funny things right like it depends <laughs> on the cardiac function and the volume and the position and the yeah. transducer level so yeah i mean I, I i run it and i i know the evidence is good for lowering your cvp so i will definitely kind of go for that yeah, yeah. there was one surgeon i had when I, like I, I gave i probably gave blood a little bit early like i was i was more it was, it was probably a communication thing where the surgeon wasn't really telling me what the level of badness was. And I know that these things can drop very quickly and I don't want to get behind on the blood. So I gave blood like a, a small bit of blood and he was really annoyed because giving blood leads to worse outcomes. So in the kind of low level of blood loss, mm. I think there's a tendency to tolerate that as long as yeah. it doesn't get you know, too, too, uh, too perfusing. That, that wasn't the question I asked, but that was just another kind of dilemma that I've had personally in the past. Yep. Um, but otherwise, yeah, that's really good. Well done, Sarah. Uh, I'm really happy with how, how you handled that, all those questions. Thanks. Thanks for your time. No worries at all. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed listening and watching this. Um, thanks very much, Sarah, for coming on and getting examined and grilled. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all next time. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.